question is how do we perform the eclipse prayer? Salat al Kusuf. It's in Arabic it's referred to as Kusuf or Khusuf. Some ulama use those two terms, Kusuf and Khusuf, as synonymous. They use them interchangeably. Some said Al Khusuf is the lunar eclipse, the eclipse of the moon. And Kusuf is the solar eclipse, the eclipse of the sun. Other ulama said, when they're in separate context, they mean the same. When they're in separate context, separate sentences, they mean the same. If they're in the same sentence, same context, then Kusuf refers to the solar eclipse and Kusuf refers to the lunar eclipse. The question is how to perform the salah. It's very simple salah. Let me walk you through the steps of it. One of the main ahadith of the many ahadith on this is hadith Aisha radiallahu anha in Sahih Bukhari. Anna qalat khasafat al-shamsu fi ahd Rasulillahi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam fasalla Rasulullahi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam bin nas faqam فأطال القيام ثم ركع فأطال الركوع ثم قام فأطال القيام وهو دون القيام الأول ثم ركع فأطال الركوع وهو دون الركوع الأول ثم سجد فأطال السجود ثم فعل في الركعة الثانية مثل ما فعل في الأولى ثم انصرف وقد انجلت الشمس فخطب الناس فحمد الله وأثنى عليه ثم قال إن الشمس والقمر آيتين من آيات الله لا يخسفان لموت أحد ولا لحياته فإذا رأيتم ذلك فادعوا الله وكبروا وصلوا وتصدقوا So you start from the description of that hadith. You start your salah, Allahu Akbar, like any normal salah, any normal fard or nafil salah. Then you mention dua al siftah. You can use the one in Sunan Abu Dawood and at Tirmidhi. Subhanakallahumma bihamdika wa tabarak asmuka wa ta'ala jadduka wa la ilaha ghayruk. Or the other one in Al-Bukhari Muslim, Allahumma ba'ad bayni wa bayna khatayai kama ba'adta bayna al-mashriq wa al-maghrib. Allahumma naqini min al-khataya kama yunaqqa al-thawb al-abiyadu min al-danas. Allahumma ghsil khatayaya bil-ma'i wa al-thalji wa al-barad. Then after that, dua al-siftah, you read, you recite al-fatiha as with any salah. Everything so far is like with any salah. Then after the fatiha, you recite a long surah estimated to be the length of Surah Al-Baqarah. Then you perform your ruku'ah. And it's sunnah to be a very long ruku'ah as well. We know the ibadah of the Sahaba. We know the ibad radiallahu anhu. And we know the ibadah of Aisha in particular radiallahu anhu who narrated this hadith. Yet when describing this salah, she said, مَا رَكَعْتُ رُكُوعًا قَطْ وَلَا سَجَدْتُ سُجُودًا قَطْ كَانَ أَطْوَلَ مِنْ I never performed a ruku' or a sujood that was longer than this one. It's very long. The length of the ruku' is close to how long one was standing in recitation. Jabir radiallahu anhu mentioned it in his description. He said, During the ruku' you say, Subhana Rabbi al -Azim. You say it as many times as you can, or the other various adhkar of the ruku'ah, Subhanak Allahumma Rabbana wa bihamdik, Allahumma Aghfir li, or the other praises, Subbuh, Quddus, Rabbul Malaikati wa Ruh, or Allahumma laka raka'at, wa bika amant, wa laka aslamt, khasha'a laka sam'i wa basari, wa mukhi, wa azmi, wa asabi, or other forms of adhkar or dua for this position, as with any normal salah. Then one raises his head from ruku'ah. Sami'allahu liman hamida. When he's standing, Rabbana walakal hamd. 
up to this point, there's nothing different than any normal salah, the mo movement wise. You would do it just like you would do any normal salah. There's a, the difference of, of course, prolonging the salah, but movement wise, it's as normal as any salah. Now you're standing from rukur. You just got up from rukur. In a normal salah, what are you going to do? Rabbana walak alham, then you had to sujood. Here's where it's different. Instead of heading to sujood, you begin to recite Surah Al Fatiha again in a very long surah. A long surah or a recitation similar to the first time you were reciting, but a little bit or slightly shorter than that. After you're done with your recitation, you had to rukur. This is the second rukur in a long rukur, but slightly shorter than the previous rukur. Then one raises his head from rukur, saying, Sami Allahu liman hamida, when he stands there, Rabbana wa lakal hamd. And he can mention, of course, the other adhkar of that position. Allahumma Rabbana lakal hamd. Mil as samawati wa mil al ardi wa mil ama baynahuma wa mil ama shi'ta min shay'in ba'd. As well as any other adhkar for that position. Then you had to sujood. This is the first sajda. And it's a long sajda. You say Subhana Rabbi Al-A'la as many times as you can. Or make the other adhkar or ad'i of sujood. Subbuh, Quddus, Rabbul Malaikati wa Ruh. Or Allahumma laka sajadtu wa bika amantu wa laka aslamtu. سجد وجهه للذي خلقه وصوره وشق سمعه وبصره تبارك الله أحسن الخالقين. Sujood is a position, as we know, of du'a. The Messenger صلى الله عليه وسلم recommended it as in the hadith in Sahih Muslim. أقرب ما يكون العبد من ربي وهو ساجد فأكثر الدعاء. And remember what Aisha said, رضي الله عنها. These are very long sajdat. ما ركعت ركوعا قط. وَلَا سَجَدْتُ سُجُودًا قَطْ كَانَ أَطْوَلَ مِنْ Jabir, Sahih Muslim, said his sujood was nearly as long as how long his ruku' was. Then one gets up from sujood, he sits in between the two sajdat. In between those two sajdat, you say the normal ad'i of that position. رَبِّ اغْفِرْ لِي رَبِّ اغْفِرْ لِي In Nawawi, Rahimullah Ta'ala, uh, this is not specific to this salah, it's for all the salah. He said in that position between the two sajdat, he said it's best to combine between the various narrations to include them all. And he said there's seven terms for that position. And they are Allahumma ghfir li, warhamni, wajburni, wahdini, warzuqni, wa'afini, warfa'ni. Seven terms for that position. He said, his opinion was to combine them all. Then he said, then, then you make another sajda. This is your second sajda, sajda. It's shorter than the previous one. That completes a full rak'ah. Then one gets up to do a second rak'ah exactly identical to that one. It's two rak'ah, two units. Each unit, each rak'ah has two ruku' and two sujood. Let me mention it briefly again. You start your salah as you do with any salah. Allahu Akbar, recitations, the dua al-siftah, fatiha in a surah. You had to ruku'. You get up from ruku'. Here's where it's different. Instead of going to sujood, you recite the fatiha again in another surah. Then you perform your ruku', which is going to be your second ruku'. You get up from that. Then you head to sujood. You sit in between the two sajdat. Then you perform your second sajda. And that is the first rak'ah. The second rak'ah is going to be identical to that. Double ruku' in each rak'ah. What's the main difference between this and any salah? 
in a one liner, each unit, each rak'ah has double ruku' in it. Very simple. And the sunnah of it, of course, is to be very long. And the second time in the overall movements, you do something, it's a bit shorter than the previous time. This method is the most popular way from the narrations on it, from, by the Sahaba, and it's the most one accepted by the majority of the ulama. And it's the best way to perform it. It's chosen by the Malikiya, Shafi'iyya, Hanabila, al Layth ibn Sa'd and others. Now that completes how the Salah is done. I don't want to confuse anyone, but we do have a lot of Talabat Ilm who follow us, Alhamdulillah. And I would like to elaborate a little bit more on the disputes pertaining to this for those who care about that from Talabat Ilm. So it's two rak'at, rak'atain. Each rak'a has two ruku' in it. Some ulama, like the Hanabila, mention that, and they also said you can do three ruku' in each unit. Some, some of them said even four ruku' in each unit. And some even said five ruku' in each unit. For example, I mentioned the two ruku' in each unit. Let me show you the three ruku' in uh, one unit. You start with the, you start your salah normally. Read the Fatiha surah with it. You had to ruku. You get up. You recite the Fatiha and a surah. Then you do ruku again. Second ruku. You get up from that second ruku. You recite the Fatiha and a surah. Then you do your third ruku. Then you get up from it. Then you had to sujood and you do the two sajdat. You can add a third because it's mentioned in a hadith related by Jabir and Sahih Muslim that supports it. The messenger performed six bowings with four prostrations. That means each rak'ah had three ruku' in it. There's even a narration where the messenger وسلم, did four ruku' in each unit. And that's backed by a hadith in Sahih Muslim by Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhuma, where he said, Qara'a thumma raka'a. He recited, then he did ruku'a. Thumma qara'a thumma raka'a. He recited, then did ruku'a. Thumma qara'a thumma raka'a. He recited, then he did ruku'a. Thumma qara'a thumma raka'a. He recited, then he did ruku'a. Thumma sajada qal wal ukhra mithluha. There's even a narration with five ruku'a in it, in each unit. That one is weak though. So the one with two ruku'ah in each rak'ah is the most popular one. It's authentic. Three ruku'ah in one unit in one rak'ah is authentic. Four ruku'ah in one rak'ah in one unit is authentic. Some ulama say what's above two ruku'ah is shav, which in shav means literally irregular or not natural, not normal. In hadith terminology, it means مُخَالَفَةُ الثِّقَةِ thiqat. When a narration of someone reliable is different than others who are also reliable. We said the one with two ruku' in each unit is authentic. So is the three, so is the four. How can there be various descriptions when it's been supposedly known that the Messenger Sallallahu only made one salah for this, Salat al-Kusuf. And it was when his son Ibrahim died. Some said we go by two ruku' in each rak'ah. It's more popular among the Sahaba and the ulama and the narrations. And the others are referred to as shaz. Others said two ruku' and three ruku' and four ruku' in each unit is all proper because they're all authentic. And the messenger وسلم, lived around 10 years in Medina. It could have possibly happened more than once. And our Sheikh Abdul Qadir, Sheikh Talham, when he taught us this, 
He said if one does the one with three ruku' in each rak'ah or four ruku' in each rak'ah, he, he said it should be exceptional. The norm is to do two ruku' in each rak'ah. That's the more popular way by narrations and by acceptance of the ulama. And uh, Ibn Abdul Bar said, Hadith Aisha and Ibn Abbas are the most authentic on this matter, which state that there's two ruku' in each rak'ah. That's uh, the Hanabila, some of the Hanabila. Now, let me add to that, the Hanaf, they adopt that Salat al-Kusuf or al-Khusuf is like any other Salat. Just like you do Fajr, just like you do the two rak'ah of Jum'ah, it's no different than any normal Nafil or Fard Salat you do with two rak'atain, that has rak'atain in it. What's their proof? They take the general hadith that the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam performed two rak'at, and they take it literally. He performed two rak'at, like the hadith, فَصَلَّى بِهِمْ رَكْعَتَيْنِ He led them in two rak'at. So they take that general hadith and say it's only two rak'at, we perform like any two normal rak'at that we ever do. The very strong response to that is that hadith is general. It doesn't deny there's two rak'at in each unit, nor does it affirm it. It's just saying that he led them, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, in two rak'at, that's all. So if I were to lead you in two rak'at for this salah, with two ruku' in each unit, you go meet someone after you, then you say, brother, we just finished performing uh, two rak'at for salat al-khusuf. Does that mean we didn't do two ruku' in each unit? No, you're just describing the overall salah. The other detailed hadith, like the one by Aisha radiallahu anha and Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhumah, detail precisely two ruku' in each rak'ah. They explain that general hadith that is used by the ahnaf. And as we said, Ibn Abdul Bar said, Hadith Aisha radiallahu anha and Hadith Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhumah are the most authentic hadith on this matter. And it's also been related by Jabir and Ubay bin Ka'ab and Abdullah ibn Amr ibn al-As and Abu Musa al-Ash'ari. That completes how the salah is performed with the disputes of the ulama. While we're on the topic, let me add to it some common questions that we usually get when this occurs. And a common question is, can I perform the salah alone? Someone may not be able to head to the masjid. Someone may not have a masjid nearby. Someone may have a masjid right by his house, but the imam is not a suitable person to pray behind. And this unfortunately is common these days because of the major deviance in aqidah that is taking place. So whatever reason it may be, can I make the salah and perform the salah alone? The simple answer to that is yes, you can perform it alone because it's only sunnah to perform it in congregation in the masjid. That's a simple answer. And let me elaborate for tulab al-ilm. There's a slight difference among the ulama between the solar and lunar salah uh, as it pertains to this matter. Ibn Abd al and Ibn Rushd said it's ijma that it's sunnah to perform the salah for the eclipse of the sun in jama'ah, in congregation. Sunnah to do it in congregation. There's ulama from the form of Ahab that related the permissibility of salatul kusuf individually. The eclipse of the sun individually. Because the hadith says, فَفْزَعُوا لِلصَّلَاةِ فَصَلُّوا the messenger said, when it occurs, hasten, hurry up to salah, perform the salah. And they said, had it been wajib that it be in congregation or in the masjid, the messenger وسلم, would have mentioned it when he stated that. Now as to the salah, the eclipse of the moon, al-khusuf, most of the Malikiyah and the Ahnaf believe that the khusuf, the eclipse of the moon, the salah for it, it's better to do it individually. The majority of the ulama say the salah for the eclipse of the moon is like the salah for the eclipse of the sun. That it's better to do it in jama'ah, but permitted to do it individually as we stated. Among their proof is that the eclipse of the moon is like the eclipse of the sun. They should be the same. The rulings on them are the same. Somewhat of qiyas of one on the, uh, upon the other. Uh, they're identical salahs. The rulings should be the same. Just like the salah of the two Eids. They're the same salah for both Eids, same here. Bottom line is there's no foundational 
uh, reason to distinguish between the Salah for the lunar uh, and uh, uh, solar eclipse. They're both the same and uh, it's better to do them in jama'ah, but if one does them individually, it's permissible. And if he has a reason for that, like health or the Imam is not suitable or it's too far, uh, inshallah that will not diminish uh, any of his reward. Another mas'ala is the woman performed this. And the answer is it's for women just like it is for men because Aisha is the one who described the hadith and she performed it herself as in the hadith in Bukhari and Muslim. Okay, another mas'ala is what if someone performed this long salah, he finished it, he was done with his salah, but the eclipse was not over. Do you get up and do two more rak'at until it's over? The salah for the lunar and solar eclipse is not a repetitious salah. It's sunnah only to do two rak'at. Two rak'at with each rak'at having two ruku' in it. Repeating it, two more and two more and two more, is not the opinion of the majority of the ulama. So what do you do if you're done with your salah but the eclipse is not over? You perform other ibadat that are established by the sunnah. فإذا رأيتم ذلك فادعوا الله وكبروا وصلوا وتصدقوا. In another narration, فافزعوا إلى ذكره ودعائي واستغفاره. So you do your salah, was established in the sunnah. After that, dua. After that, istighfar, takbir, dhikr, various forms of dhikr. Sadaqa, there's even a hadith in Sahih Bukhari that says to free the slave. Hadith Asma رضي الله عنه. أمر النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم بالعتاقة في, الكسو في كسوف الشمس Let's assume the opposite scenario You are in Salah and some loud mouth shouts in the masjid or where you're at the eclipse is over You're in Salah and the eclipse is over. You find out for, you find out through any uh, of the various ways that one can find out. Now the reason for the salah, for the eclipse is over. Do you abruptly taslim out of your salah? The messenger sallallahu said, فَصَلُّوا وَدْعُوا حَتَّى يَنْكَشِفَ مَا بِكُمْ Make salah and dua until the eclipse is cleared, until it's over. But you don't abruptly end the salah and just to sleep out of it. You go through it, but briefly. Al Buhuti mentioned this. He said you continue with the salah normally, but make it brief and short. You no longer now need to pro prolong it. Continue it to the end, but briefly, because the reason for it has, alhamdulillah, ended. What's the timing of the salah? What's the exact timing of the salah? The proper timing is from when the eclipse starts until it ends. All that time is proper timing for the salah. It's not done before, nor is it made up after if one misses it. Because the hadith, the messenger وسلم, said, when you see it, make salah until it's over. That's the timing of it. From when it starts till it ends. Another very important question that sometimes we get is do we go by the astronomers or by the scope or by binoculars? For example, in a few days, there's gonna be an eclipse on the 7th or 8th of this month. Do we start arranging for it and telling everybody to be prepared and get gathered together in the masjid for that? The answer is we go by bare eyesight, similar to Ramadan. Here the Messenger وسلم, as in the Hadith in Sahih Bukhari, in Muslim, and in Nasa'i, in Abu Dawood, in Ibn Majah, use the term, if you see it, if you see the eclipse. فَإِذَا رَأَيْتُمُوهَا فَافْزَعُوا إِلَى الصَّلَاةِ فَإِذَا رَأَيْتُمُوهَا It's worded very similar, same term. رَأَيْتُمُوهَا Same word, 
about the moon siren for Ramadan. Sumu li ru'yatihi. Wa aftiru li ru'yatihi. Observe your fast upon the moon siren. So the more correct opinion is to go by siren, bare siren, not by the word of the astronomers or the binoculars or the telescopes or anything of that nature. Centuries ago, Ibn Taymiyyah ta correctly addressed this matter. He said in the 24th volume of his fatawa, knowing the timing of the eclipse beforehand is possible. And subhanallah, this is, he's saying this approximately 700 years ago. He said, when astronomers agree on a day, it's very rare that they go wrong. But even with that fact, he said, there's no Islamic ruling based on what they say. Eclipse, the salah for it is not, salatul kusuf or al khusuf, is not performed unless it's seen. And what they mean by that is bare eyesight. Another mas'ala, do I perform it uh, loud or silent? Is it a loud or silent salah? The simple answer to this is that it's a loud salah, whether it's the eclipse for the sun or the moon. That's the opinion of Ali radiallahu an, Al-Bara' ibn Azib, Zayd ibn Arqam, and uh, Ahmed ibn Hanbal, and the two companions of Abu Hanifa, and Ibn al-Mundir, and Ishaq ibn Rahawi. But let me elaborate for Tullab al-Ilm. So the basic answer is that it's allowed Salah. But for Tullab al-Ilm, the hadith of Aisha clearly states, and the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, jahara fi salat al-khusuf. Hadith Aisha clearly states that the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam recited loudly in the Salah of al-khusuf. The eclipse of the moon, the salah for that, Ibn Hajar said the ulama related in ijma' that it's a loud salah. The eclipse of the sun, the salah for that one, is somewhat disputed. Shafi'iyah and some Malikiyah say if it's the eclipse of the sun, it's sunnah to be a silent, quiet salah. If it's the eclipse of the moon, they said it's sunnah to be loud. Because it's a night, night prayer. While the sun eclipse is going to be a day prayer, so it should be quiet. The correct view on this is that the ruling for both, for the lunar and solar eclipse, should be the same. Because there's nothing substantial to distinguish them apart in this matter. The issue of one being during the day, and that day salawat, as they say, are quiet, is not a correct distinction. Because Salatul Istisqa is prayed during the day and it's allowed Salah. So is Eid. Abu Hanifa also is among those who said it's a silent prayer and they backed it up with some weak ahadith, first of all, or a hadith that can be explained that the Sahaba who narrated them were far and didn't hear the Messenger وسلم's recitation. Because in some narrations, it actually specifies that the Masjid was full. Or some of their proof is not clear and direct that it was a silent prayer. So it's allowed prayer. Uh, and the sunnah on it is that it should be allowed prayer. Whether it's the solar or lunar salah. Another masala is can you raise your hands in salatul, kus salatul kusuf for dua? And the reason I mentioned it is because there's a popular hadith by Abdul Rahman ibn Samura, who said when he saw the Messenger وسلم, leading the salah, فَأَتَيْتُهُ وَهُوَ قَائِمٌ فِي الصَّلَاةِ رَافِعٌ يَدَيْ When I reached the Messenger وسلم, in prayer, he was raising his hands. Some use this statement, not just in the salah, they use it to prove that one can raise his hands in sunut. Some say, it was done, he was raising his hands before the salah started. Ibn Hajar went to the extent of saying he was raising his hands to head to ruku'ah. Some, some ulama said that's very unlikely. And some say it's a general summarized hadith, so we don't take the details from it. The best explanation is that hadith Abdul Rahman ibn Samura 
is a general summarized hadith. Ibn Hadith Ibn Abbas and Hadith Aisha are more detailed and they didn't mention that he raised his hands in this salah. After the salah, when one makes a dua, in this particular salah, if he decides after it, because the Prophet ﷺ said, after that, to make dua, if he raises his hand due to this hadith and the other general hadith about raising the hand, then inshallah that's proper. What if somebody makes the salah short? I can't stand and read Surah Al-Baqarah. Is it acceptable? You get that question frequently. It's acceptable, but he misses out on the sunnah of prolonging it. Is there a khutbah to the salah? If you do in congregation, is there a khutbah? Some ulama said it's sunnah to give a khutbah. That's uh, Shafi'i said that, and it's one of the two opinions of the Hanabila. And now he said, Jumhur of the Salaf said it's sunnah to give a khutbah afterwards. The Messenger وسلم, definitely gave a talk after he performed the salah. Abu Hanifa and Ahmed in another opinion, and Imam Malik say he did give a talk, but it wasn't a khutbah. It was just to teach him the salah and to address the issue of them thinking that the eclipse was caused by the death of his son Ibrahim. And he wanted to teach and teach them how to do it and correct that matter. Some of the Malikiyah were in between those two opinions. They said it's not a khutbah, but the Imam should uh, give a simple reminder. It's a close call, but what gives it more weight that there is a khutbah and that it's sunnah is that the method the Messenger وسلم, addressed them afterwards was the same way he would begin his official khutbah. In Hadith Aisha, فَخَطَبَ النَّاسَ فَحَمِدَ اللَّهَ وَأَثْنَى عَلَيْهِ Is it wajib or sunnah? Is it wajib? Is this salah wajib or sunnah? I know there's an eclipse. Do I have to perform it? The correct view, in the view of the majority of the ulama, in fact, now we uh, allege there's an ijma on it, that it's sunnah mu'akkada, an affirmed sunnah. It's sunnah because the Messenger وسلم, performed it, as in Hadith Aisha and Hadith Ibn Abbas and many other hadith. It's not wajib because of the hadith of the man who came to the Messenger وسلم, and asked him about Islam. The Messenger وسلم, taught him about the five compulsory prayers. He told him, you must do these five prayers. The man then asked, هَلْ عَلَيَّ غَيْرُهُنَّ قَالَ لَا إِلَّا أَن تَطَوَّعَ The man said, is there other than these that you just taught me, these compulsory prayers, is there any more I have to do? He said, no, unless you choose to make other nawafir. Is there an adhan for it? Some ulama related in ijma that there's no adhan or iqama for it. And other ulama related an ijma that the way to call for it is as salatu jami'a because the hadith Aisha that the message she said that the messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam ordered a caller to shout that the salah is about to begin in congregation kasafat al shamsu ala ahdi rasulillah sallallahu alayhi wasallam fa amara rajulan an yunadi as salatu jami'a Now, what I can add to that is, uh, what's the wisdom behind this? The wisdom behind this salah, in this occurrence, is what the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said when he finished the salah. He said, إِنَّ الشَّمْسَ وَالْقَمَرَ آيَتَانِ مِنْ آيَاتِ اللَّهِ تَعَالَى لا ينكسفان لموت أحد ولا لحياته ولكن الله عز وجل يخوف بهما عباده There are two signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he strikes fear into his slaves. A warning from Allah, a wake-up call. People tend to go about in their day-to-day -day lives and they take for granted 
the signs and blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala like the sun and the moon and everything else. There's those who are mindless and don't think Allah enough. And who could ever think Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala enough? Worse than that are those who commit the sins. Worse than that are those who live on Allah's earth, enjoy the sun and the moon and disbelieve in him or associate partners to him or even deny his existence. So the eclipse is basically a wake-up call. It's a sign for people to repent and to return to Allah and ask forgiveness for forgiveness. It's like the verse, We send the signs to warn and to make them afraid of destruction. A warning for those who are good to be better. And the evildoers to repent and to return. Now, in the speech that the Messenger وسلم, gave, he directed them about adhkar and istighfar and dua. And he, then he corrected the matter, which was in jahiliyyah. They used to believe that the eclipse would only happen uh, at the death or birth of someone special. And during the Messenger وسلم's time, it coincide, coincided by the will of Allah to, have, to occur on the day that his son Ibrahim died. So what was the rumor? فَقَالَ النَّاسُ كَسَفَتِ الشَّمْسُ لِمَوْتِ Ibrahim. The people began to say it occurred due to the death of Ibrahim. The messenger wanted to correct that. He told them the sun and the moon do not eclipse because of the death or life of anyone. When you see them, when it occurs, pray and invoke Allah. What's unique about this in a side issue is that this in itself is a big sign of the truthfulness of the messagehood of our beloved Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Had he been trying to seek fame or a false prophet, he would invest on this and say, yeah, today the sun eclipsed because my son died and I was sad and I shed tears. So the sun eclipsed. But that's Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The true, trustworthy and truly inspired one. The truthful, confirmed one, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Finally, let me share a personal story that I always remember when I mentioned this, and it's how I, I learned of the Salah. And there's many benefits within this story on Talab al-Ilm from my father. Every time the story is, uh, the eclipse is mentioned, I always remember the story. When I was eight years old, we were in Medina memorizing Quran while my father was studying in the university. Every few months on weekends or in mid-semester breaks or other breaks, we would go on a family trip from Medina to Mecca to perform Umrah. And it was a very long, deadly road back then. It was only two lanes. One lane heading to Mecca and one to Medina. One lane each, each way. No lights and at some times it would be damaged it was dubbed the highway of death. Anyone who lived during that time will tell you about that highway. In fact, my parents used to make uh, istikhara, an extensive dua, every time we were about to go on that trip. It was common to see deadly accidents due to the conditions and also people falling asleep as well. On one of our trips back from a weekend trip, it was Friday. The next day was Saturday. Saturday is the first day of, of the school weekday. So Saturday is like Monday here. The first day of the week to go back to school. On the way back, the fan belt for the car got caught and we were stuck in the highway. There was no mechanics and nothing in sight. We ended up pulling over to the side and we spent the night on the side of the highway. Later on in the morning, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent us someone to resolve the matter. 
There was no cell phones. There wasn't even land phones back then, landline phones, no patrol, uh, nothing of that nature. SubhanAllah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent someone and he helped us. What happened was because we spent the night on the road, we didn't reach there on time. We were all absent from school on Saturday. And in the four years that my father was in the University of Medina, he never missed a single class, let alone a full day. In fact, he was never even late to a single one of his classes. This was the first time he was absent a full day. The students' desks were arranged in a certain order in the classrooms. And he was known in the start of the semester to take his desk and chair and put it awkwardly in the front side of the classroom next to the teacher so he can write and hear every, on almost every single word that the teacher says. He was known for that. And I remember as a child, some who are big names today used to come and ask him for his notes to photo, photocopy them. That Saturday, subhanAllah, an eclipse occurred. The following day, Sunday, I didn't have school for some reason. And when I didn't have school, my father would take me with him to the university. And the teacher there was the Imam of the Haram, Abu Bakr al-Jazairi, the known Mufassir. He was also a teacher in the university as well. Every time he saw me, he would always lightheartedly banter me uh, when he saw me. The Saturday that we missed the class, there was an eclipse. When the Imam of the Haram, Abu Bakr al-Jazairi, walked in the classroom, he gave salam, he spoke a little bit, and he smiled at me and at my father. And he humorously said, had the Messenger وسلم, not said that the eclipse doesn't uh, occur because of the death or birth of someone, I would have said yesterday's eclipse was because your father missed classes. Of course, the classroom, that out, I left. So I left as well, but I didn't know what he was talking about pertaining to the eclipse. That was when I learned the Salah of the Eclipse.